Okay. Are you going to turn off the light or something? Uh, good morning, and thank you for joining us today in this uh, recorded presentation. So uh, we wanted to make sure that everybody got a lesson today, and so this is going to be our online-only lesson. So you're getting something that the people in-house aren't doing. And to uh, make sure that everybody's still kind of on the same page, what I figured what I wanted to do, I didn't have time to do a full review of the entire Book of Romans, kind of, tooking, kind of taking a, a 10,000 foot view of the whole book as far as an entire theme. Didn't think we'd have a chance to do that in class, but we get to do that here. So what I'd like to do today is just to sort of back up. We've been having a really uh, in-your-face kind of a, a view of, of the, the letter, and I just want to kind of zoom back, and we're going to review the entire thing as a whole. And so uh, one thing I'd like to start with is just to to get uh, to refresh our minds as to uh, who the, the the writer is, who the uh, recipient is, uh, what's the the situation in which uh, the, everything is being written. Uh, I think it's important for us to examine that for any of these letters, uh, especially the ones that are directed towards uh, specific congregations or specific cities. And this is one of those letters. And so in those situations, context is king. And so we need to, to know something about the person writing, something about the person who's receiving the letter, the kind of issues that they're, they're dealing with, the kind of people they are, et cetera. And so with that, first, we need to understand who the writer is. And I think we all know Paul. And uh, Romans 1.1, it tells us that uh, this letter is written by Paul. And the circumstances and place in which Paul is writing at. So where is Paul writing? Uh, so in Acts 18, we have, uh, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria. And with him, Priscilla and Aquila. At Sentry, uh, he had cut his hair, for he was under a vow. And so we can compare this with uh, Romans 16.1 where uh, Paul uh, says this, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Centre. And uh, Centre was uh, the port city uh, just outside of Corinth. And so if we take a look at a map, uh, we can kind of see on the left uh, the entire uh, Greek peninsula. And uh, on the right, we have a zooming in of uh, where Corinth is. And we have sort of in the middle of that map, we have uh, the city of Corinth, which was the capital of the Roman province of Achaia. And then just uh, a few miles to the east of that, you have the port city of Centre. So if someone wanted to go into Corinth, uh, you would arrive via Centre. And so that is where Phoebe is from. And when Paul says, uh, I commend to you Phoebe, she was one of the individuals that arrived with the letter. And so uh, I think likely that's going to be uh, uh, the place in which Paul's writing, therefore. And so that's the location. And then the when, uh, based upon the idea that people had already been kicked out of Rome uh, by this point in time, that you know, there's Priscilla and Aquila was with him. Uh, I think that this puts us uh, right around 57 AD in which this is written. And so the, the biggest uh, event leading up to this is going to be uh, Claudius, the emperor of Rome, kicking Jewish people out of Rome, and then the emperor Nero taking over uh, by 57 AD, and or Nero took over in 54, and then this letter was written a few years later, and Nero actually allowed the Jewish people to come back into uh, the city of Rome. And so that takes us to the, the, the recipient of the letter. And so this is the church at Rome in uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 7, uh, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. And so Paul's audience is a church. Uh, his audience is Christians, and so he's not trying to exhort people to become Christians, uh, 
but yet he is uh, exhorting people who already are Christians. And so this is the church at Rome, and so all of these people who are called to be saints. Uh, and so where in Rome were they? And so most likely, uh, these people w would have originally been Jewish people. A lot of the original uh, people who would have converted, a lot of those would have been Jew Jews, or at least people related to Jews. And so these messages would have been delivered to synagogues, and perhaps some of the Jewish people accepted, many of them rejected, and a lot of the Gentiles became aware of the gospel through hearing the message first preached at synagogues. And so therefore, I think it would be uh, most likely that this congregation would have been in the neighborhoods in which those synagogues would have existed. And so this is in the southwest part of the city of Rome uh, was the section where many of the Jewish people lived. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the, the leaders at the time, they didn't necessarily keep that part of the city as nice, but that's, uh, that's where it would have been. And so you have uh, this church that is, uh, that is in that section that has uh, perhaps even out of a synagogue itself. And so you're going to have Jewish people and uh, Gentile people in that. And let's look back at Acts again. And so we're not going to focus on century this time. But after Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And so there was a time in which this church existed where there are Jewish Christians and uh, Gentile Christians, but yet the Jewish Christians for a time, for several years, they were kicked out of the city of Rome. And then when Nero became emperor a few years later, uh, they were allowed back in. And so what that would mean would be that uh, the Jewish people would have approached Christianity in a certain way that probably uh, they kept a lot of their way of life. They kept a lot of their traditions. And so it would have been, uh, it would have been sort of like practicing Judaism, but yet with Jesus kind of added to the mix. They would have observed the old law in many ways, but also believed that Christ is the Messiah. And the Gentiles would have had perhaps a, a back seat in that because they were still seen as guests within uh, the synagogue setting. And so they would have, uh, those Jewish people would have left and Jewish Christians would have looked exactly like itinerant Jews. And so when Claudius kicked Jewish people out of Rome, uh, both of those people, Jewish Christians and practicing Jews would have been kicked out one and the same. And so these Jewish Christians would have been gone for a time. And my thought would be that those Gentile Christians would then be kind of left to their own devices for several years. And so they would not be practicing some of those same things. And they would go their own way. And the things that these uh, Jewish people were sensitive to, things like uh, eating meat that's unclean, uh, celebrating certain uh, days of rest, certain feast days, certain fast days, those Gentiles would not have necessarily carried on those traditions. And so the Jewish people are gone for a few years, and then now they're back. And from their perspective, they probably want to go back to doing everything the way that they had been doing it before. But those Gentile Christians would have wanted to continue with the changes that they had made and not being sensitive to those things. And so now you have two groups that have their own sets of traditions, their own sets of beliefs, uh, some groups having a sensitive conscience in some things, another group having none of those sensitivities. And so these two groups of people having to come back together and somehow figure out a way to make things work. And we still have Christianity in its infancy, so it's, it's not as if we can say, well, why don't they just each have their own congregation? It's still such a young religion that there wouldn't have been enough people. There, there wouldn't have been enough organization for these people to have worshipped separately. And, and plus, that's really a false solution in making them do that. And so somehow these people had to figure out how to move forward. And so they're dealing with some of that, that strife. Uh, another thing, uh, if we look at Romans 1.13, uh, Paul says, I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you but thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. And so it's important to note that this is a congregation uh, 
that Paul had not personally met. He had not planted this church. He was not personally familiar with the people of that church. And so he's, he's not writing to people that he knows personally, but he's just writing to Christians for their benefit in order to encourage them. And so uh, with all of that, let's kind of look at the structure of the overall letter. And I would divide this letter up into two major portions, uh, but I think we can kind of divide it up into three. We can take that second uh, half and divide it into two pieces. And I think the bulk of it is our first eight chapters, and that is this idea of salvation by faith. And so this would have been something that this group of people would have wrestled with. Uh, what is the nature of faith? And we'll get into that in, a, in just a second. And then the second part of this letter, I think could be argued all the way from uh, chapter nine, verse one, all the way to 15, 13, comprises one big section. Uh, if you, uh, I think if you're looking at a 10,000 foot view of this letter, uh, but if we want to divide that into two pieces from 9 1 to, uh, to 11 36, or from chapter 9 all the way through the end of chapter 11, uh, Paul talks about the gospel and the Israelites. And so, what is the, the relationship with people who are uh, ethnically Jewish and the gospel? Are, are they still part of God's plan? Are they being punished? Are they redeemable? Are they worth talking to? Uh, and then, but uh, my thought is that all of that conversation in Paul's mind leads us into the conversation that he has about the specific congregation in Rome, starting at, at chapter 12. And so from 12, one to 15, 13, uh, Paul is dealing with uh, these specific issues that are happening in the Roman congregation. Uh, and these are the issues that I have already uh, started to talk about. And so it's just this, uh, this idea of, uh, of these competing traditions and these competing ideas, these uh, competing issues of conscience and debatable matters, basically. And then from 1514 to the end of the, the work is the conclusion. And so it's just Paul's wrapping up, he's giving uh, benedictions, he's giving greetings and such like that. And we, we won't really cover that much here, uh, mainly because it doesn't, uh, I, I don't think it factors in too heavily with the, the overall theology of the work, which is what we're focusing on. Uh, but in the following class, when we wrap up the book, we, we will be talking about that, just not for this, uh, this overview. So with that, let's kind of look at each of these sections in detail. So first, this section about salvation by faith. And so Paul begins after his initial greetings in chapter one. Uh, I think his overall point is that human wisdom uh, does not lead to righteousness. And so remember, he's dealing uh, with this uh, Gentile group and this Jewish group. And so I think he begins chapter one uh, addressing the Gentile Christians here. And so this idea that human wisdom does not lead to righteousness. And I think from a Gentile perspective in this synagogue setting, I think that these uh, Gentile Christians would have approached Christianity as perhaps a human philosophy. And so you have all of these different competing human philosophies that people might have subscribed to, things like uh, asceticism, uh, hedonism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they were just uh, ways of figuring out life. And just like someone today might, uh, you know, uh, get a book or they might uh, get a self-help tape or something like that. And it's, you know, I've cracked the code on life. And if you follow these easy steps, then you are going to live a good and fulfilling life. I think these Gentile Christians might have approached Christianity like that, that this is just another path that people have figured out how to live a good and fruitful and productive life. But Paul, I think, here refutes that, that this idea of human wisdom, uh, it doesn't lead to righteousness. And the, the picture that Paul paints here in chapter one, it's, it's kind of disheartening, and it shows the fruit of human wisdom. And you have this idea that, uh, that as people become wise in their own eyes, the, 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 they go into this downward spiral and their situation gets worse and worse and worse. And uh, the very end of that situation is they're actually celebrating things that are evil and reviling at things that are good. And so they've just left to their own devices, they've kind of flipped her around. And to illustrate that, it reminds me of this book that I had found uh, 
uh, on the internet, and it's called uh, Amoeboid Movement. Uh, if we look at the cover of that book, uh, on the screen, if we could look at the cover of that book. <laughs> Evidently, I'm doing a good job. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, it's this old book called Amoeboid Movement, and it actually kind of fits in. So if we look at the next slide, and you have this uh, map that this guy drew, wrote. And so uh, the, the idea of this book was how do things move about in nature? Even if you have something as mindless as an amoeba, is there some sort of logic in the way that it moves? And he wanted a test to see how things uh, even scale up to that. And so here's sort of an overview map looking down, and there's a road. And then on the left side, you see a little dot, and then there's an arrow uh, pointed up. And so he took a person out in the middle of this field, and he blindfolded them. And he pointed them in a direction, and he just said, walk in a straight line until I tell you to stop. That seems like a really easy task. You know? And this is basically a person self-orienting in the world. And so the next slide shows us what the results of this person being blindfolded in the middle of a field and go walk in a straight line. And so what the guy wrote is that uh, he sort of go, went around in all of these loops, as you can see, and the loops even go tighter and tighter and tighter. So over time, the guy walks less and less and less in a straight line. And in fact, uh, in the road right there in the middle, it has a label that says stump. And the guy finishes uh, his write-up of what happened in his observations. He said, the stump made necessary a termination of the experiment. So this guy walked around in a loop in a tighter and tighter spiral until he tripped over a stump. And I think this is a great illustration of chapter one in the book of Romans, in the letter to the Romans, in that we as people, if we try to orient ourselves as far as right and wrong, we're going to get worse and worse and worse. And it's like this spiral. This is anything but walking in a straight line. And so we don't do a good job at that. And so we need something bigger and better. And so that kind of takes us into chapter two. And so the Jewish people might be sitting a little bit higher in their pews at that point, if they sat in pews, uh, which they did not at that point in time. But they might be kind of thinking, oh, you know, well, we have the law. We're better off. We have the oracles of God. We've been entrusted with these things. And so, therefore, we are in a better situation. We are better equipped than these Gentile Christians. And so Paul kind of levels the playing field. He says that the, basically that the law of Moses doesn't lead to righteousness, that the law doesn't make people righteous. And so uh, the law only instructs, instructs us as to what righteousness is. It doesn't actually make someone righteous. And the fact of the matter is, is that people fail time and time again to live up to the requirements of the law. And so the law is really just evidence that people don't live up to God's requirements and God's expectations. And so the law of Moses doesn't lead to righteousness. And so then that leads us into chapter 3. And the conclusion is, well, if human wisdom doesn't make us righteous, if the law of Moses doesn't make us righteous, well, then who does that leave out? Well, not really anybody, does it? So nobody on their own is righteous. Uh, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so uh, I think Paul has, uh, in these first three chapters, has identified the problem. And so no matter if you are Jew or you are Gentile, you are going to need something bigger than yourself if you want to be saved. Because no matter who you are, no matter what your traditions are, Jew, Gentile, you are going to sin in your life. You are going to fall short of God's expectations. And so therefore, you are going to need something external to you in order to make you right with God, if you ever to have any kind of hope. And so then that leads us into chapter four, that righteousness, in fact, comes by faith. And Paul gives us examples of that, that that's God's plan from the beginning, and that's God's expectations from the beginning, that, uh, uh, that uh, Abraham had faith in God. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him. It was reckoned to him as righteousness. And so if that was true for Abraham, if Abraham's faith was counted as righteousness, then that same thing is true for each and every one of us, that the currency that we have with God isn't our perfect, spotless, blameless actions, our currency with God is our faith. And so that means that we don't earn it, 
but yet we put our trust and we lay our trust in God, whatever the path that, that he, he uh, gives to us. And so that leads us into chapter 5, that we have peace with God, that we have this reconciliation with God through our faith. And that's faith in Jesus Christ. And so Jesus' sacrifice brings the opportunity of having this peace with God. And so faith in Jesus, it connects us with that peace. And uh, further in chapter 5, one might even question this idea, well, how can one man fix all of this situation? How, how can one man make that big of a difference in the world? And, uh, and Paul compares two men that made all the difference in the world that uh, death entered into the world through the sin of Adam and that Adam introduced the concept of sin into the world. And so one man caused the problem and then death is conquered through one man, Jesus. And so one man caused the problem and therefore it's just as log logical to say that one man could fix that problem created by one man. And so death is conquered through one man, Jesus Christ. And so we have this peace through faith, and we have to have this means of being connected to Jesus, and that connection is created through faith. Then that leads us into chapter 6. So what does that faith mean? I mean, does it mean that I just lay my trust in God and I can just do whatever I want? I can go back into whatever sinful life I want to, but yet I just call on God's name? But uh, Paul says that we, we must reflect the kind of life that Jesus lived. And so therefore, we must be the kind of people that are dead to sin and we don't allow it to rule over our lives. And so, you know, shall we continue to sin so that grace can abound? Heaven forbid, right? And so we need to live holy lives that are acceptable to God. And so we should allow righteousness to rule over our lives. And that's part of it. If, if Jesus is the thing that we are trying to be connected to, then we need to reflect the kind of principles that Jesus had when he did live. And then into chapter 7. So that gives us the relationship of, G of uh, Christians and the law. And so there's no condemnation uh, for those who are in Jesus. And uh, that through that, um, that the relationship of Christians and the law. And so we, we try to uphold the law as Christians. And then in chapter 8, we have a victory through faith in Jesus. And so there's no condemnation for, for us. And so that, is, uh, that, makes, uh, uh, that is, it makes a man righteous through his faith. But we, we still need to strive to live this life that's toward the Spirit. And instead of slipping back into these ways of the flesh... But, uh, but we also have to question, you know, that has a cost to it, uh, trying to live a Christ-centered life and a Christ-like life, uh, especially for people living in that first century time. I mean, there was a significant physical cost to living a godly life and, and making no concessions for the flesh. There's a cost today, but I would have to imagine the cost that, that those people bore was far greater than today. But Paul tells us that we have this victory through our faith, that, that the benefits that we have from, from this eternal life that we get through our faith, they're worth it. And so through the Spirit, we have this eternal life. And so we need to live towards the Spirit rather than live uh, towards uh, the flesh. And so it's worth those future benefits. And so uh, no matter how bad... Uh, no matter how bad things can get in this life, uh, it, it's worth it for the next life. I will make a point. Uh -huh. Only because it's interesting. Is they did a study, and I forgot what exactly how it was phrased, but yeah. people that received things for free and didn't have to work for them at all never appreciated it. Right, right. And so, you know, I think that might be sometimes our problem is we don't have to work very hard. There's not, we don't have a struggle if we don't want it. Right. You know, there's not a government that says you can't do this. There's not a people that says, I'm going to oppress you. Right. And so I, I think sometimes that makes us fat and lazy. So. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, in, in some ways they had it way more difficult than, than we do. But in some ways we have it way more difficult than they did. Uh, you know, like for them, Christianity was a life and death kind of decision to make. But for us, that decision can be way more subtle. And yeah, I, I think that can be more of a difficult thing. And I know I, I probably said that. I know I've even said that up here before. But uh, people have written books about uh, people who have made that ultimate choice. You know, choose to deny your faith or you're going to die. Uh, 
uh, I, I think that one of the, I think there's a whole book uh, written about that. I forget what it's called, but uh, it's talking about people who who chose to die and you know to to proclaim their faith. And I know that one of the examples in that was from the Columbine massacre, that there were people uh, that I guess they were approached and they were said, you can deny or I'm going to kill you. And some of those people made that choice. I'm not going to deny my faith and they died. And, and I think that's a very, very difficult decision for someone to have to make. And I, I would like to think that I would pass with flying colors if I were put into that horrible, horrible, difficult situation. And I, I don't want it to to take away from that. I mean, I, I admire someone who had that conviction that was able to stand up, but sometimes I do wonder if it's more difficult to live for your faith. And so sometimes it's easy that I'm not going to make this huge change. I'm going to resist this big line in the sand that I can see, and I'm going to stand up to that. But sometimes I think it's more difficult to make those daily compromises in my life that I'm going to stand up to that gunman and say, you know, I'm never going to deny God, shoot me. But on the other side, it may be tough. Well, it's just one Sunday morning. I can hit the snooze button again, and I'm going to sleep in. And that becomes another Sunday morning and another one and another one. And we make these daily small compromises in our lives. You know, it's, it's just one questionable action. It's just saying this one questionable thing. It's such a small thing. And over time, those little tiny changes add up. And so, yeah, I think in some ways that uh, they had it more difficult, and in some ways we have it way more difficult. It's a great point. Uh, but either way, whatever it costs us, whether we live in an oppressive country that's oppressive towards Christianity or one that's a lot more subtle in that oppression, uh, whatever cost it has for us, what, those future benefits that we get are, are far more uh, important than whatever those costs are. And, uh, and one might ask themselves if they are in that difficult situation, can this mighty nation, can the materialism that we, we have to struggle with, whatever it is, can, can we be snatched away from God by these powers of the world? And, and Paul ends this section with this encouragement, this idea that if God's for us, then who can possibly be against us? What power in this world could possibly be stand up to God? And so God has put this plan into place and there's nothing externally in the world that can separate us from that plan. And so we, through Jesus, we more than conquer the things of this world. We more than conquer the powers of this world. And uh, it's usually translated as we're more than conquerors. But that word there is actually a verb. And it's saying we more than conquer. Uh, and so it's not even close. It's not as if we just skid by through through the the the... The, the justification that we have through Jesus, that we just barely win in a squeaker, but we just more than beat, we more than conquer uh, through, through what he has done for us. And so if God is on our side, then who could possibly be against us? And that is great encouragement when we are trying to struggle through, uh, through the, the temptations of this world. So that leads us into the next section. And that's with chapter 9. And so I think that this begins the idea of Paul uh, addressing the problems inside of this, uh, this congregation. And I think that it's very subtle here. It sounds like Paul is talking about generalities here in chapter 9. But I think that he is introducing the idea that these Jewish members of the congregation are every bit as important as the Gentile members of the congregation. And so chapter 9, Paul introduces it with uh, the idea that he wants his fellow Jews to be saved. And, and in fact, the links that he would go for them would be that uh, he would be accursed in their place if he could. He can't, but if he could, he would take on the curse of disbelief for these itinerant Jews who have rejected the gospel. And so Paul wants these Jews to be saved. And remember who these Jewish people are. Uh, these are the people that followed him from town to town. These are the people who stoned him. These are the people who made false accusations of him to get him into trouble. Paul still says these Jews who reject Jesus, he would die in their place if he could. And so I think he's introducing this idea that, that, that people who are of a Jewish background are not... Uh, completely irredeemable. They aren't completely cursed. They shouldn't be completely cut off and just spat upon, but yet they are people 
who uh, deserve our love and our attention, whether they are converted Jews who are within a congregation or whether or not they are Jews who need the gospel. They are worthy of love. And so that's why I think it connects us to that. It's, it's telling them that they have value. Because remember, again, these, uh, these warring sides of conscience. And I think that some of these Gentile Christians might have convinced themselves wrongly that, well, hey, you know, these Jewish people are being permanently cut off from God. And here we are in a church, and we had a congregation, and it must have been God who removed these Jewish people from our midst so that we could go ahead and continue uh, with Christianity without them. And I think Paul is gently reminding these people that, uh, that these Jewish people are still worth it. And so that brings us into then uh, chapter 10. Oh, wait, I, I want to talk about chapter 9 a little bit more. And that uh, there, I think there's an important factor here in that not all people who are descended from Israel are Israel. You have this idea of spiritual Israel. And so uh, this idea that, you know, God has rejected people who have rejected him. But, but even though it's all part of God's plan, God's rejection is still fair. And so Israel, it failed to achieve righteousness because it sought it by works instead of faith. And Gentiles who never had that tradition, they never historically were pursuing righteousness in that way, but they still found righteousness because of their faith. And so still Paul's uh, buttressing this idea of approaching God through faith. And that's going to be important in this section. So then continuing into chapter 10. So if we can approach God through faith, then anyone can express faith. And so if faith is the way that we can approach God and have peace with God, if faith is the thing that saves us, then anybody can express faith. And so therefore, anybody can be saved, both Jew and Gentile. And so uh, it's not as if anybody can ever be permanently cut off, whether we look at people like that if they're Jewish or we look at them from anything in their life, people of high economic standing or low economic standing or people from certain countries or certain races or whatever, everybody can express faith ultimately. And so we can't cut anybody out. And then I think we have to ask ourselves then, if faith is the thing that saves us, uh, how do people come to have this knowledge? And so if in this specific situation, if there are Jewish people who have rejected uh, Jesus Christ, how do they come to have that knowledge that can uh, to cultivate that faith that will save them? And so uh, ultimately it takes somebody to preach the gospel. And so uh, we have Romans 10, 17, one of those cornerstone verses that we have that you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And so that word has to be preached to people and how powerful it is to preach the word to people who, who don't know any better. Uh, we don't learn of what God's expectations are. We don't learn how to approach God on our own, just magically, but it takes someone delivering that gospel to another individual. And so those things that Christ did, that example that we have, the deeds of Christ have to be told to others. And that also has another uh, ramification to it in that faith is a conscious decision that's made by the believer. If faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, then that means that someone is hearing and they're processing that information and they're making a conscious decision based upon that, that decision. And yet many Jewish people rejected the message and therefore they didn't benefit from it. And so we are free as individuals to accept the message and we are free as individuals to reject the message. And so that leads us then into chapter 11. So if Jewish people have rejected the message, is that a sign that Jewish people are now completely condemned and outside of God's promises? And so Paul reminds us, just as there was a remnant in the time of Elijah, there was a time, there, there, there's still a remnant at this point in time in the first century. Paul would be a great example of that himself. He was once a very uh, devout Jewish person and gave up all of that at great cost to himself in order to follow what God's truth was. And so not all uh, Jewish people are, are bad, so to speak. There is a remnant. And so Israel's rejection of God is not total. It's not complete. And so people can't just be written off just because they have that Jewish background. And I think this idea is going to play an, an important role whenever Paul talks about these specific issues in the coming chapter that this congregation is dealing with. Uh, 
And so uh, also Israel's rejection isn't final. It's not uh, something that can't be changed. It's not something that can't be redeemed. And so their rejection is not final. And in that, Paul introduces this analogy of a cultivated olive tree. And so you have this olive tree that has been kept perfectly by, by some attendant throughout history. And uh, the tree has been perfectly watered and perfectly bred and, and all of that. And it's just this perfect tree. It's cultivated. But yet, wild branches. So from an olive tree that just sort of ran its own way, wild branches from one of those trees was grafted in. And those branches were grafted in due to their faith. And so this is an analogy to the Gentiles. And natural branches from that tree were cut off due to their lack of faith. And so those natural branches, they stand for Jewish people who rejected Jesus. And so you have these wild branches that don't even belong in this tree. They've been grafted into the tree. You have the branches that look like they belong, but because they didn't bear the right fruit, they were cut off from the tree. And so all of this goes into this idea that Israel's rejection isn't final because none of this is permanent in this analogy. You have branches that never belong that were grafted in. You have branches that do belong that were grafted off. And so faith can cause these natural branches to be grafted in. If completely wild branches that don't belong there at all, they were grafted in, then certainly the natural branches can be grafted back in. And furthermore, lack of faith can cause these wild branches to be cut back off. If they were grafted in, certainly they can be cut off again. And if the natural branches that belong there can be cut off, then certainly these wild branches can be cut off too if they don't serve the proper purpose. And so I think this is a great example that none of us have a permanent, uh, our, our salvation is not permanent. It's something that has to be maintained, that we have to maintain our faith. We have to maintain that connection uh, with God through Jesus Christ. And so I, I think this is a great analogy that refutes the idea that a person, that once they are saved, they are always saved. And, and so we need to be uh, wary the, uh, of the kindness and the severity of God. And we need to be mindful of that, that he is kind enough to allow us to be grafted into this tree. But we have to also be mindful and respectful of God that if we do not fit the pattern in which he has for us, that we can also be cut off from that tree. And so God is very kind. He is very merciful to us. He loves us, but he is also severe. He also has expectations for us. And because he is perfectly righteous, he cannot, uh, he cannot abide by our unrighteousness when we do not fit his expectations. And so uh, we can be cut off. And, uh, and God's bringing in of these Gentiles also serves a purpose. It's a means to uh, allow these Jewish people who have rejected Jesus, it's a means to, to help them to see that the error of their ways. And hopefully they will be jealous, as Paul puts it, of these Gentiles, and they will be jealous of, the, of seeing them receive these promises and these benefits. And hopefully that jealousness will make them want to come back into the fold and, uh, and approach God by the means that God expects them to. And so again, all of this is sort of part of God's plan. And so that gives us, uh, that puts us into these issues uh, that are specific to the Roman church, our next section. And I think that everything that we've read so far kind of builds up into this. And I think that the main thing that we can take away from the previous chapters that we have read is that, is that these Jewish Christians have every, um, have just as much right to be as part of the body of Christ as these Gentile Christians. They are worth putting up with. They are worth reaching out and saving. They are worth it. They can't just be written off. They can't just be disenfranchised, so to speak. They're, they can't be marginalized. It, it's important that they're reached out to. It's important that they're saved. And so uh, this idea of these specific issues and this uh, friction between these Gentiles and these Jewish people, it permeates uh, the rest of the, this letter. I think most of it is concerned with that. And, uh, and chapter 12 begins uh, with this idea, I think, of how we should approach this friction uh, in the church. And I think this one idea is what permeates the, the, the attitudes that permeate through the rest of this entire section. Uh, 
And it is the idea that uh, Christians present themselves to God as living sacrifices. And so we are sacrifices to God. And so we are to be holy and acceptable to God. Holy in the sense that we are unshared with anything else. Acceptable, meaning that we aren't a sacrifice on our own terms, but we are a sacrifice on God's terms. And I I think the idea of sacrifice that's being used here is, is the idea that, number one, it has a cost that a sacrifice is typically, it's, it's totally consumed for, for the benefit and the worship of a particular deity. And that, that sacrifice is completely devoted and completely consumed to that task. And the honor and the privilege doesn't belong to the sacrifice. It belongs to the thing that's being sacrificed to. And so it's not as if the sacrifice Nobody ever really worries about what the sacrifice wants. You know, think of the Passover sacrifice. No one is thinking, you know, that was just the best sacrifice ever. You know, uh, remember the one off in 1912 that was just the perfect lamb that we sacrificed. It was amazing. And everyone celebrates that. It's not as if anyone asks the lamb, you know, well, how would you like to be sacrificed today? The lamb is completely devoted to that task. And any other sacrifice that's given, it is the thing that's being devoted. And we as Christians need to approach our faith in that same sacrificial manner. That it's not about us. It's not about how awesome I can be and how much attention everyone can pay to me and how much my preferences are are taken care of. But the sacrifice should concern itself with how can I best honor and glorify the thing in which I am being sacrificed to? And so for us, we need to be approaching Christianity not as how can this make me shine the most, but how can I praise and glorify God the most in my actions? And that should translate into how we treat one another in our congregations. And so as such, uh, since it's not about us, we shouldn't think too highly of ourselves. We shouldn't think, you know, this is all about me on Sunday morning. We need to think that it's all about God. And uh, we should think with sober judgment that we should remember that it's not because my light shines so much that, uh, that makes everything work, but it's that God was so kind and merciful to give me this, uh, this avenue of faith to approach him. And so we should think our, of ourselves with sober judgment and that, that each of us also plays an important role in the body of Christ. Each of us can play a different role. And so no matter what our talents are, no matter what our abilities are, we are useful. And as human beings, sometimes we see certain roles as being more important than other roles. We might pay attention and thanks to some roles, and we might ignore people who are filling other roles. And I think that Paul is telling us that everybody is important, that no one role, even though if people respect it, you shouldn't think so highly of yourself. And that also translates to our background. And so Jew, Gentile, rich, poor, whatever, you are no more or no less valuable than somebody in a group that's different from you. And your opinions and your preferences are no more or no less valuable than somebody else's. And and so we need to remember that, that it's not about us. It's not about what I bring to the table uh, as far as, you know, being better than anyone else, but it's what can I do to serve the whole and make the whole body function with my talents. And with that in mind, if we're not thinking too highly of ourselves, then then we need to show this love to one another, that we are concerned about our brothers and sisters in Christ and the people who are around us and how to help them to glorify God to their maximum potential. So rather than saying, well, they don't do exactly what I do, they don't think exactly what I think, therefore, I'm going to try to diminish them and I'm going to try to make myself shine. We need to show this love and concern for one another. And that kind of love that Paul says isn't just lip service, that it's something that has to be genuine. It can't be acted. It it can't be hypocritical. It can't be pretended. And and that love isn't just for our brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, that we are to show hospitality for strangers. And that hospitality is to show love for strangers. And so that love extends to people who are strangers. And in fact, it even extends to people who are our enemies. And, uh, and the purpose of all of this is to, to try to find ways and to get people into the fold, try to find ways of preaching Christ to people. And, and again, you know, if somebody wrongs me, uh, 
then what's more important, me getting justice for myself, or is it more important that I find a way to reach that person and, and have them join us and be part of the fold and to be part of the body of Christ? And so many times in our lives, we want this justice. But if we want justice for ourselves, then again, aren't we putting ourselves as the focus of attention? And so if we are living that sacrificial life, then we think, okay, something bad happened to me, but how can I use that to my advantage in order to benefit the body? How can I use that to my advantage in order to make this an opportunity to glorify God? So again, it's that sacrificial living. So that love should be extended to our, our enemies. Uh, continuing into chapter 13, how does this love extend? And so that, that Christian's love and respect, it, it also extends to earthly authorities and how we have a relationship with earthly authorities. And so uh, uh, these authorities are put in place by God himself. And so resisting these earthly authorities is effectively re resisting God. And I, I think we also are presenting Christ in a, in a certain light in the way that we respect earthly authorities. I think that the world understands the way that we respect authority uh, by the way that we treat earthly authorities. And so if we disrespect earthly authority, then they're going to think that our respect for godly authority, spiritual authority, is nothing. It's just a farce. And, and so I think we have to treat earthly authority something that they do understand with respect so that they get that we treat spiritual, godly authority also with respect. And so we can't resist God's authority. And so we give, therefore, whatever respect is due, whether it's paying taxes, tributes, or honor and support for government, basically being good citizens. And being those good citizens is reflecting Jesus in our society. And again, hopefully glorifying God and bringing people into the fold. And so whether it's in the church, whether it's with these strangers, whether it's with his enemies, or whether it's how we conduct ourselves as citizens, we ought to show love. We ought to reflect Christ. And so that love is the fulfillment of the law. And if we have that love in our lives, we are fulfilling the law. And if... Um, and you can take all of the things that the law prevents, things like stealing and murder and so on and so forth, that if you love your neighbor, you would never even dream of doing any of those other things. You would never dream of doing anything that would be harmful or detrimental to them. And so love is the fulfillment of all of those things. And so if we put that love as our first concern, I think a lot of other things are just going to fall into place. And so that leads us into chapter 14. And so we have the foundation of these issues. And now for the issues themselves. And so with that idea of this love and devotion to God's will and glorifying God's, uh, God in everything that we do and trying to strengthen uh, the, our fellow members of the body of Christ rather than getting our own way. So then Paul takes all of this information, and I love how Paul does this. This is one of the reasons why uh, I personally uh, resonate with a lot of Paul's works more than anything else, because he, he just builds this argument, and he weaves all of these facts together to reach this conclusion that you can only reach. Uh, and, and so based upon all of this, uh, the specific issue is that there were some who were abstaining from unclean meats, and there were some people who were observing other requirements of the law of Moses, that they were uh, observing certain feast days and fast days and days of rest. And so you have this issue of Jewish Christians wanting to retain a lot of the, uh, the traditions of the old law, but yet still be Christians. You had Gentile Christians who that didn't mean anything to them, and they didn't feel that they needed to do that. But from the Jewish Christian perspective, it wasn't just that this is comfortable for us and we like doing it. From their perspective, it was a true matter of conscience that if they gave those things up, they were disrespecting God. If they eat, if they ate meat that was unclean, whether it be an unclean animal, whether it be a, an animal that was not killed and butchered in the appropriate manner, an animal that maybe for all they knew could have been offered to an idol, and they just didn't know. They didn't have that supply chain. And so from their standpoint, they would rather honor God by not eating it than to risk eating it. And so this is a matter of conscience for them. And, uh, and the reality is, is that we have from other scriptures, it's nothing. Those traditions don't really truly mean anything. These people are free uh, from having to, to practice those traditions. 
but from their perspective, they were still bound from them. And so to disrespect those things, to violate those consciences, uh, it would be breaking faith with God for them. And so they were doing these things as a matter of conscience. And so in this situation, we need to have unity in these matters. And I think we can take uh, this example, things that maybe we don't specifically deal with. We don't have people wanting to practice the old law in our number, but yet we do have people who have matters of conscience and matters of preference among us that can vary. And sometimes we can get caught up in these differences of opinion and we can form our factions and, and these factions turn into divisions. And sometimes those divisions can cause churches and congregations to split. And those splits can cause true damage and dysfunction to congregations. They can make people not believe sometimes. They can uh, make outsiders view the church in a very negative light. And those people may choose never to become Christians because of what they see the Lord's church uh, doing and the way that we sometimes behave. And they think that, that church and our relationship with God is, is nothing more than arguing about these uh, seemingly trivial matters. And, and so we've got to be careful with that. And so in these matters of conscience that are just strictly matters of conscience, we need to strive to have unity in these things. That instead of arguing with one another, we need to find our common ground. And so the, the weak in this situation, and in this situation weak means the people who have that weak conscience, that sensitive conscience, those people in that situation shouldn't give final judgment. They shouldn't judge the people who are strong. And so it's, uh, they shouldn't render this final judgment, and it's God's place to render final judgment, not ours. And the strong shouldn't resent the weak. And so the, the people who are strong, the people who don't have those matters of conscience, they shouldn't look at the people who do as, you know, ah, we got to put up with them all the time. They're always, you know, sensitive about this. We can't do certain things around them, but I really want to do that. Man, I just really hate to be around them. Can't be that either. We can't resent those people. So either side that you fall on, you can't judge. You, you can't judge in this final condemn, condemnation kind of sense. And if you're on the strong side, then you can't resent. And so we need to have this unity. We can't just be bickering about things. And so those who do not have these issues of conscience, they, they also shouldn't put up stumbling blocks in this part of re, this idea of resentment. So if someone is grieved by the meat that you eat, then you shouldn't eat it in front of them. You, you shouldn't be f uh, t flouting this behavior in them that, that may cause their conscience to suffer or maybe even tempt them in a way that violates their conscience. And so uh, ultimately the kingdom of God is bigger than these issues. It's bigger than eating meat. It's bigger than certain special days. And so we shouldn't destroy God's work over these minor, small, piddly issues. And so we need to pursue what creates peace and we need to pursue what creates an environment that builds people up, that strengthens their relationship with God, not all bickering about these tiny issues, these issues of conscience that ultimately just destroy that relationship and destroy that work that God has created. And so that leads us into uh, the next section where this idea of the weak and the strong. And so with that idea of love and devotion, uh, that, that we have with one another and that we, we need to, that the, the strong have this responsibility to abide in, in the weak. And we need to, and there is this responsibility that we have for one another that, that we don't just bring people in to bicker with them and that we focus on the things that unify us. And so ultimately, I think that this last section is just a reminder that, that we are all in this together, that regardless of, of what side you fall in on a matter, it's not about just getting your way. It's not uh, about just getting your preferences. Uh, but what's important is that we are, are growing the church and that, that but being the church and growing the church is more important than whatever our personal preferences are in these matters. And, and so we may come from different backgrounds. We may come from different places. Uh, we may have different abilities. We may have different emphasis on things. I may think that, you know, some things are more important than other things. You know, I, I might focus on benevolence. Another person might focus on missions. And we all may, may approach uh, Christianity from a different way. We may have different sensitivities. Some people may be sensitive uh, 
to the kinds of songs that we sing. Some people may not be sensitive to that. Some people may be sensitive to having classrooms and kitchens and things. And, and instead of focusing on all these differences sometimes, we need to work through these kinds of things despite our differences. And, and so we need to focus on what unifies us rather than, than dividing ourselves on these debatable matters. And so ultimately we just need to, we, we, we have this, this obligation to, to bear each other's burdens and each other's weaknesses. We have to work it out and we have to be strong in the, in the body of Christ. And so I think that's the big part of the second section and uh, the big part of, uh, uh, of this entire part of Romans. And so we, we've got to work it through. And uh, finishing up with that is the conclusion. And, you know, uh, Paul just does his customary greetings and such. But uh, I think if I were to take two things from this entire letter, I think the first half is just a reminder of our relationship by faith, and then the second half is just this idea that as, as Christians, we need to be united, and that regardless of our background, we, we all need to work together for strengthening the body of Christ rather than just focusing on my part of it and uh, the, the people who think exactly uh, what I think. So. Uh, we will be concluding this uh, study. We will be uh, finishing up chapter 15 and 16 uh, next week, Lord willing, and then we'll be moving on from there. So uh, I thank you for uh, tuning in, and I thank you for your attention, and we will continue with that, Lord willing. Thanks. Oh, closing prayer. Thank you. Thank you for abiding with the week. <laughs> so let, let's conclude with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for giving us this time together, and we, we thank you for the word that you give to us, and we, we just pray that we, we live by the example that you give to us, and uh, we, we also pray that we, we're proud to wear your name, and we, we pray that we aren't ashamed uh, of living by your principles, even when we're, we're around people who are of the world, and just help us to be eager to, to share your word and to, to share your ways with, with the world, and so that that as many as people as possible can come to have that, that everlasting life with you. Uh, Lord, just uh, please be watching over us as we go about our daily lives, and just uh, please, uh, please keep us safe, and please uh, keep us uh, to be back here at the next appointed time. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. My